Hey, uh, I'm Greg. I work for Tulsa.com, another Expedia brand. Uh, sorry, I've already messed up. I'm like one second in. Okay, so I, work, I used to work for Hotels.com until a couple of months ago. So if you want to ask me about Hotels.com or HomeAway, feel free to grab me as well. But today we're going to talk about effect types. So what is an effect type? Um, if you use Slick for database access, you might have already used an effect type. So in Slick, uh, you use DBIO action, and uh, basically this is uh, an effect type for, work, for working with database operations. And it's kind of interesting that they use that rather than just future everywhere. If, I'm hoping people have used future, by the way. Has, any, has anyone not familiar with future? OK, Povelas. For, I, work, I worked with Povelas, so uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for trolling. Um, yeah, so, but there, so there, are, there are a bunch of different kind of effect types out there, but we're going to focus on uh, general purpose effect types. So these are, they exist to encapsulate any side effect in code you have. And, so really general. And a bunch of these have popped up in the Scala community in the last few years. So there's Cast Effect IO, Scala Z ZIO, Monix Task. And we're going to take a look at these three. And I'm going to try and like justify why you should use effect types, why you shouldn't just use future, and, um, and compare and contrast these a little bit. So yeah, first we kind of need to talk about future. I basically want to convince you that future isn't good for working with side effects full code. Um, and that's kind of weird because I actually quite like features. Um, yeah, like coming to Scala from Java, I was used to like working with threads and doing locking and stuff like this, and that's pretty horrible. And with features, you can compose concurrent asynchronous code quite nicely. You can just use it in a full comprehension. Um, unfortunately, features, I would say, are not very good for working with side effects. So yeah, they're good for async current codes, bad for side effects. And for those who don't know, so future is eager. So when you create a future, it starts executing straight away. And it's also memoized. So when the future finishes, that keeps that result around. And you can access it multiple times. Um, and yeah, you, you can compose it nicely with a full comprehension. However, um, I would say you can't compose it that nicely if you're doing side effects. So this is, this is an important point, which is easy to gloss over, and I know I did for a while. So when you, if you create a future, and inside that future, you perform a side effect, just by creating that future, you're performing a side effect. So when you create a future, it schedules it in an execution context, and pretty much as soon as possible, it's going to start running. So you're starting that side effect. You're kicking this side effect off. And um, I think, yeah, like, why do, does that matter? Like, do we care? Um, OK, let's take a step back. So why are side effects bad? I mean, shout out, anyone. Well, why don't we like side effects? Don't compose. Don't compose, yeah, yeah. Why don't they compose? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You cannot use a substitution model. Say again, sorry? You cannot use a substitution model. You can't, yeah, you can't use a substitution model. So they're not referentially transparent. So. If you have, yeah, exactly. So, like to take an example, like if the type doesn't tell me anything as well. So if I, if just with side effects, if I have a function which returns unit, I don't know what it does. I have to like go and look at the code, and almost certainly it relies on the state in my system being in a certain way so that I can execute this function that returns unit. And um, yeah, like side effects aren't good. And whenever you create a future, you're performing side effects. So let's take a look at futures. So here I've just got a full comprehension, and I'm uploading documents. And uh, this returns a future of unit. So presumably it does some side effect. And we said that monads compose nicely inside full comprehensions. So when you, when you use a future in a full comprehension, you get this sequential ordering of operations. Um, and this works okay. However, once you start um, substituting things out, right? Once you start extracting like a variable, eventual a. So if I run this now, and I've just, I've just got this this object that will run it ten times, then uh, you can see that 
it's going to be non-deterministic in order. So sometimes A goes first, sometimes B goes first. Because with futures, when you extract them like this, you're creating them earlier. You're starting them at the same time. You can't just substitute them whenever you want because they're not referentially transparent because they're performing side effects straight away when you start them. And um, this is actually really useful. Like I use this all the time because I want to run my futures in parallel. Um, but I think this makes it hard to reason about. I think that you know I can't. I literally just if I extract variable, it changes the performance of my program. If these effects relied on each other, it wouldn't work. And if I put this in like a service, I have to be careful about when do I actually call the future. Um, so you, I, you kind of don't realize it because you're doing it all the time, but like you have to be really careful when you start a future, and it would be nice not to. So futures are good, side effects are necessary. Futures are bad for doing side effects. Um, we need to do side effects. We, need to, we want to be able to do them concurrently and asynchronously. I just think that effect types are a better way of doing that. So let's start with Monix. So has anyone heard of Monix? Anyone used Monix? OK, cool. So Monix is a library for asynchronous programming in Scala. And that sounds very general, because it's quite general. And it's actually an umbrella of a few projects. Um, but we're just going to focus on Monix eval. So Monix eval provides task. And this is an effect type. And it's quite similar to future, really. Uh, you can compose tasks in full comprehensions. And uh, also, like future, when it, you have this idea of like the failure case, and that's an exception. So yeah. Unlike future, though, a task isn't eager. So it's, it's lazy. It's lazily evaluated. You have to explicitly run it. And also, it's not memoized. So if you run a task twice, it will actually run twice. So let's take a look at harmonics task. So this is the same thing. Um, looks pretty similar. So now my upload function that I'm using returns a task of unit. And I can still compose this together in a full comprehension. Now I have to say run to future. But the difference is that like, if I extract these, Task is referentially transparent, which means I can freely substitute, pull things out, refactor, not worry about when do I call the service to get my task. I don't have to worry about that sort of stuff anymore. And if I ran this again and again, it would always do the same thing. So this, I believe, makes it easier to reason about your code and easier to refactor and stuff like this. But we've lost something already. so. Parallelism. I just showed you with futures. If you pull it, if you refact, if you pull these variables out, they run in parallel. Well, what do I do with monics, right? So um, let's take a look at that. So with you can't do it inside a full comprehension, basically. So what you can do is you can say uh, task. So we're using monics task, and we're going to there's different operations we have for this. So we have uh, parzip2 is one of them. This is, this is more awkward, like, uh, for sure. But the idea is like you're explicit about this, and it's clear when you're doing it. So this way, you could actually run them concurrently. And um, oh, you can also. Um, if, if people have used future.sequence, um, when you create a lot of futures and sequence them, you'll, you'll run it in parallel. With Monix, sequence wouldn't run things in parallel. So if I run this, it would run one at a time. Sorry. This will run one at a time because that's by default, that's what it would do. So in, with Monix, you've got to be explicit and you've got to use different methods. So for, in this case, we can use gather. And gather will actually run everything in parallel. 
So you can still run things in parallel, just you have to be more explicit about it. And the other thing as well is uh, what about execution context? So um, with future, every time you map over it or you flat map over it, you need an execution context. So in Monix, uh, like cause at the end of the day, like each time you're running a future, it needs to run on a thread. And um, with Monix, you have a scheduler. So let's take a look at scheduler. So if we go back to this example. So here, um, so I said that you know when we create a task, nothing happens. And it's, it's only when I do, in this case, run to future, that we actually, here it's going to run against a scheduler and give us back a future, a cancelable future in this case. So, yeah, so this is all already quite nice because it means you don't need the uh, implicit tax of having an execution context everywhere inside your app. Um, yeah, that's, a lot of the time when you create a future or a task, if you're just doing CPU bound operations, you don't really care where it runs, but you always have to provide that execution context. And here, because it's lazy, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, the other thing as well that I should cover is sometimes this isn't good enough. So here I could give it like a scheduler, like the global execution context. I can create a scheduler from that. Um, but sometimes I might have IO bound, IO blocking I.O. operations, and I actually need to say, yeah, this task I, I want to do on a separate thread pool because it's going to block a thread. And so for that, you still have the ability to do that. Uh, you can say execute on, and you can give that a scheduler. And you can create schedulers from an, an existing execution context you might have. Um, they also have like convenience methods for like creating an I/O execution context uh, scheduler. Scheduler actually does extend execution context. Um, yeah, so you can do this. You can actually the the certain pieces that you know that are doing blocking I/O, th you, those you can make run on a separate thread pool. But everything else, like you don't worry about it. You just let the caller do that. Okay. So, yeah, so far I've kind of been focusing on um, it's easier to reason about, you can refactor your code. But there are other benefits as well, even if you don't buy into that. So, performance. So, with a future, every time you perform a map operation or a flat map, you have to give the execution context. And you're, forced, you're, you're introducing an asynchronous boundary. So, every time you're uh, scheduling another piece of work to run on your thread pool. And so you're finishing your operation, and then you're saying map and schedule this, and there's like this this wait, this delay between it finishing, submitting it to the thread pool, and it being executed. And in all of the effect types we're looking at today, um, that's not the there's no need when you map to actually force an asynchronous boundary. So because it's lazy, what you can do is you can take if you've got three map operations, you can compose the functions inside those three map operations into one and just run it straight away as soon as the task finishes. So yeah, you can actually, you actually get a lot better performance with uh, any of these effect types. And uh, yeah, that, that's a pretty good reason. Another one is resource safety. So um, all of these effect types that we're gonna look at have the idea of a bracket so a bracket is kind of like the finally block of a try-catch. So you can have your task and say, like, once that's run, uh, run this, right? So release this resource. And if you use, like, FS2 with cat's effect, this is used there to give you resource safety. Um, also, another point as well, like with Monix, for example, there's a lot of convenience functions we get. So here, the one, one thing that's really useful, would be, would be really useful when I worked at hotels.com is timeout. So when I worked here, we had a web service where you know, we just fetch a couple of data models from Cassandra, and then we merge them and transform them a number of times to generate our response object. And because we, 
we didn't want to slow down the customer experience, we introduced like circuit breaking or timeouts. So we just timed out after 100 milliseconds. And with future, there's actually no way of stopping a future that's, once you've started the future, you can't stop it. So timing out a future, you can't really do. But with, uh, with Monix, you can actually time things out. So if I introduce a timeout here, and I say timeout after 100 milliseconds, Then, oh, before I turn into the future. Then this will actually time out. So if I was to try and do something like this with future, I would get a timeout exception, but I would also continue to run these, uh, these, these the operations in the background. And if, like, if I did 600 milliseconds, then you'd see the first one will run, and the second one, we have a timeout. So you actually can really time out things with, uh, with effect types. OK. So that's Monix. Let's have a look at Cat's effect IO. So yeah, this is another effect type. Uh, this one under the Cat's ecosystem. And to be honest, it's quite similar to Monix. So um, yeah, it's, it's lazy. It's not memoized. Um, it's, it's not surprising that it's quite similar because the author of Monix is also the main contributor to Cat's Effect. Um, but that said, there are some differences. So the differences basically are that Cat's is more principled. So Monix has a lot of convenience operations. I, did, I didn't mention, but with Monix, you can actually say this task is memoized. You can say memoized, and then it will remember the result, like a future. And um, that's something that um, breaks referential transparency, and so CATS doesn't provide that by default. So, and Monix also has really good interrupt, like to and from future, and um, yeah, CATS is just a bit more <laughs> principled and doesn't provide lots of these convenience functions. Otherwise, it's quite similar, so let's have a look at that. So it's pretty much exactly the same. <laughs> um, I've got a, now I've got an I.O. of unit instead of a task. Um, these are refer tra referentially transparent. I could freely move these out and refactor. And now I call unsafe to future instead of run to future or whatever it was. And yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same. One difference is that um, Monix, in, with Monix we took a scheduler when we actually evaluate this task. So we're actually running it on a thread pool. And then the code will return immediately, and you get a future which will finish later. With Cat's IO, when I run this, there's no asynchronous code in here. It's all synchronous IO. And so this will actually just run on the current thread. But yeah, to be honest, like, yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same. And uh, yeah, so let's take a quick look at Scala ZIO. So once again, it's quite similar. Um, to be honest, uh, I've not looked into this one as much, um, it, but it, it's definitely lazy and not memoized. So you still have referential transparency. Um, and it's easy to reason about. The main difference is that with uh, ZIO's IO monad is a bifunctor. So a functor is anything which has a map operation. So like if you use list, option, you can map over it. By functor is anything where you have map and left map. So you have this idea of like a success and a failure case. So like in the standard library, you've got either. So you might like have an error type with your either and you can modify that. So with ZIO, if I create one from like a pure value, then there's no way an error can happen. So the error type is nothing. And um, this is different to uh, Monix task and Cat's, Cat's Effect IO, where, whereby they both, they, t they kind of take the stance that exceptions are unavoidable on the JVM. So they make you use throwable as your error type. But with, but with the ZIO, you can actually change that. Um, yeah. We can take a quick look at the same code example in Scala ZIO. Um, this one, I would say, is even more principled than Cat's Effect IO because 
I struggled to get an example where I could just run it to a future. So I had to implement uh, the Scala ZZIO app trait. And yeah, but essentially, same thing. The, the, the main point is just that this is easiest to reason about. And things like timeouts are actually doable for any of these effect types. Yeah. OK, so that's ZIO. So it talks about cat's effect IO. Cat's effect is actually like a, a broader thing. So it's got this specific effect type, IO, but it's also got a bunch of type classes for, for effect types. So just as a list might have a type class, like the, the monad type class, so you can flat map over a list. You have functor, so you can map over a list. An effect type can have uh, these type classes, bracket, sync, async. And uh, here's a nice image that explains what they do. So like, and this is from uh, this Twitter account, I recommend you follow it, lots of cats comics, basically. Yeah, uh, so bracket is this thing which gives us this like finally block, the uh, resource safety, all the way up to like concurrent effect, which basically can, can do anything. Um, yeah. So ZIO, cats, IO, and Monix task all implement these type classes. So, this means there's like good interop between them. You could mix them if you wanted to. But importantly for us, it means that any library that's coded against cat's effect, you can use any of these effect types. So if you, if you use relation databases, Doobie, you can, with Doobie, you can use any of these. If you use FS2 for streaming apps, you can use any of these. Or if you do like, <coughs> if you use Finch or HTTP for S, you can use any of these effect types. And it's kind of, up, it's up to you. And uh, yeah, to tr take this analogy of like comparing effect type to lists a bit further, um, just as if, if, if people have used cat's non-empty list, this is a list where you guarantee it's not empty. So you can't ever do uh, non-empty list.head. If you, if, you, if you do list.head, you can get an exception. Cat's non-empty list like gives you safety and guarantees that that won't happen. In return, it kind of makes it a bit more boilerplate-y to create one and use them. And yeah, in, in that way, like cats IO and Scala ZZIO are more restricted than task. It's a bit more, it's a bit harder to do parallelism, stuff like this. Um, and in another sense, ZIO is less restrictive because it doesn't restrict the error type. You can, you can freely choose that. So let's take a quick look at the type class, uh, cats effect type classes. So, here I have implemented, I've implemented my upload function from earlier, and now you get to see the horrible implementation. It's just sleeping and then doing a print line. Um, but I've, I've coded this against cats, the cats effect type classes. So um, it needs a timer because I'm gonna sleep, but this is gonna be like a non-blocking sleep. And I need uh, the sync type class because I'm gonna capture a synchronous effect. So print line is like synchronous. Um, yeah, but now this can return any F, any, any effect type which implements these type classes, I can use with this function. So to use it with cats, I just say, okay, run it with uh, cats IO, and this will work. And same with monix, I can just say run it with task, and same with like ZIO. So yeah, you can, you can write your code against cat's effect, and then you don't have to like choose one of these. You can work with any of these. Um, you can also use it for interoperability, so you can turn any of these into any, any of the other ones. So if you want to create a ZIO IO from a cat's one, you can do that, or from a monix task. Yeah, and you can just do that for all of them. So I guess like, Disadvantages? <laughs> Why not use it? Um, there's, there's more to learn. Like you've got to you've got to learn a bit more. Um, I don't think it's that much. I think I think the main thing is like when you come to futures, it's a completely different model to any other way you would do concurrency and stuff. Here it's quite similar. You're still composing it in the same way. Um, yeah, the, the different API to learn, different methods to learn, but that's that's probably not a big deal. Um, also less less widely adopted. So. Adoption is pretty good. If you use like the, the type level ecosystem, then this is quite wide adoption. 
But if you're saying if you're using Play or Aka Streams, it's going to be quite awkward, right? So um, even then, it's not that bad. I'd recommend you you can you can implement your services against any of these effect types, and then just in your Play controller, you can say run to future, or in your Aka Streams code, you could do map async and just run to future inside there. Okay. So yeah, in, in summary, uh, side effects in futures are bad. They make it harder to reason about your code and compose your code and move things around. Um, there's a number of good alternatives. Effect types, not only do they help with reasoning, they also give you better performance, real cancellation like and timeouts, uh, resource safety. And yeah, kind of my thoughts are Monix is like the easiest to move to coming from futures. It has a really good interrupt with futures. Um, Cats and ZIO are more principled, and so things like running stuff in parallel may be a bit harder, but that's kind of a trade-off, right? Like, if it makes it more difficult, but it stops you from messing things up, it's like with non-empty lists. You can use a list, and then you just be careful that you never call heads in case it's an empty list. So it's kind of the same here. Like, Monix gives you more power as a user, but just be careful. Um, Another thing was that using ZIO, one of, the, one of the things that was really, the scholars at ZIO, one, was, one of the things that seemed really appealing to me is the fact that it's a bifunctor. So you have control over the error type. So I don't know if people are using either T in cats. A few, a few. So yeah, there's people that are using either T and futures. You probably have either T or future everywhere. And um, you probably wouldn't need to if you're using ZIO everywhere. Um, so it's quite appealing to me. Unfortunately, um, if, you're use, if you're using any of, if you want to use like Doobie or Finch or anything, that's coded against Cat's Effect. And Cat's Effect, it requires that the error type be throwable. So you can't take advantage of control over the error type if you're using any Cat's Effect, if you're using it via the Cat's Effect interface. So if you're using any of these libraries with ZIO which is kind of annoying. Um, maybe that'll change in future. Um, and then for me, like, so Monix is the most mature, it's the oldest, and the documentation is really good, and it's quite easy to move to from future. So like, for me, that's kind of my preference. Um, yeah, ZIO is interesting, but doesn't feel like the docs are not as mature. Um, Stuff like that. But yeah, so that's, that's my takeaways. Use Monix.